Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, third installation in the GFMD uh, webinar series uh, for capacity building. And um, we've just gotten our ducks in a row. We've got our uh, panelists from, from uh, different parts of the world gathered today. We have someone as far away, uh, two, as, far away as Bolivia, so it's, uh, it's um, great that we can, we can say welcome to you all here uh, online. Without further ado, I'm going to give the word to Michael. Thank you. Hi, um, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, thank you very much indeed for being here and giving your time for this webinar. Uh, as some of you know, I've uh, run a couple of these on behalf of GFMD in the past, but not in this panel-based format. So this is largely experimental. But um, I would encourage you to uh, participate as much as, is, as the technology allows, because obviously we're very interested in sharing ideas, sharing experience, uh, looking at the uh, challenges and opportunities uh, around fundraising uh, from all their different aspects, uh, and, uh, and seeing if we can come away with this with some conclusions about how to do things differently, uh, or perhaps how to capitalize on some of the opportunities that are out there that we were not so aware of previously. Um, it's going to be a, a discussion, a conversation based around broad kind of thematic areas. So I hope to uh, divide the, um, the, the webinar into two separate parts. The first focusing on um, strategy, on business development strategy, uh, and the second on, um, on relationship building with donors and maintaining those relationships over time. Uh, the first step will be to, uh, to introduce the panel. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I, I worked for BBC Media Action for 17 years with uh, a, a focus largely on um, business development. And for the last two years, I've been working as, a, as an independent consultant uh, with a range of clients across Europe, uh, focusing primarily on media projects. Uh, I'd like to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, um, although I'm sure uh, they are known to some of you already. So perhaps we'll start with you, Josh. Okay. Hello. Morning, everybody, or afternoon there. Um, my name is Josh Laporte. I'm working at the European Journalism Center, and I'm the lead on our media development and press freedom programs, which uh, often involves a lot of fundraising to support these programs. Um, currently, I'm working in the middle of a five-year program funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs in cooperation with Free Press Unlimited. We're working in 17 countries across the globe. Uh, it's called No News is Bad News. And I'm happy to continue to chat more about my experiences around that. Thank you. Um, wait, wait, shall I go? Okay. Yeah, go yes, please, Melissa, go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon, good morning, everybody around the globe. Um, my name is Melissa Rendler Garcia. I am a, a media development advisor for the European Journalism Center. I've been working with Josh and his team, oh, for over about 10 plus years. Over 10 years. Right, when the EJC at, was at a point where they wanted to actually expand the range of programming and assistance that they wanted to provide outside of the European Union. So one of the things that we started to do was look at the ways in which we could do that and strategize and how we can broach um, looking at um, the media and also trying to get the development sector um, engaged. You know, those are two very different sort of populations that needed to come together. So one of the things that I did is help them start uh, uh, expanding their programs and helping develop proposals that were palatable to donors. And last but not least, uh, Nicholas, a few words about yourself. You need to take the mute, mute off your microphone. Got it, got it. Hi, uh, my name is Nicholas Shatar Morris. I'm the CEO of uh, Project Syndicate. Um, I've spent a lot of time fundraising, primarily from uh, private uh, foundations, big and small, um, whether that's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Heinrich Boll Stiftung or the Open Society or, or many in between. Project Syndicate is, um, uh, itself sort of unique. We have a hybrid nonprofit for-profit model. So um, have some also experience in pure business development from syndication to events to magazine publishing and sponsorships and everything in between. And hopefully all of that can uh, feed into the conversation and be applied in the fundraising um, realm as well. Um, so looking forward to the, the conversation. 
Great, thank you very much indeed, uh, all three of you. Um, as, as you'll have heard uh, in the week, and we have the opportunity to tap into a, a wealth of experience today. And, uh, and you know, I, I also look forward to, to, to hearing the various insights that, that the panelists have. But also, again, I repeat, you know, any interventions from the floor that can add uh, to our broader kind of perception of the, uh, of the challenges of fundraising will be very welcome indeed. Um, I think that uh, you'll all agree that uh, fundraising for media development over the years has become increasingly challenging. The, uh, the market has become more competitive, there are more players. Uh, I think it's also fair to say that many of the donors have become more demanding in what they require uh, from us uh, during bidding processes. Uh, and. Uh, all, almost all business development efforts require a huge investment of time uh, and resources, which not all organizations have. So it, it's also fair to say, I think, that the, uh, the market is, is unbalanced or has been balanced very much in, or tipped very much in favor of the organizations that do have those resources, do have long track records, do have extensive portfolios uh, and therefore can continue to, to, to bid for the uh, for, for big size grants and I think it's one area we'd like to look at today is is, is how smaller players can uh, increase their footprint uh, and and um, uh, operate on an equal footing with um, some of the bigger players but it's true to say that all organizations that I've had any dealings with have an aspiration to develop, a, 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 to have a strategy. Uh, a strategy is, is what makes uh, all organizations tick and allows you to forward plan, uh, uh, allows you to uh, develop a, a specific profile that others in the market then recognize. But I think it's extremely difficult to develop business strategies uh, in this market. Uh, and either uh, organizations attempted to take a very opportunistic approach, uh, apply for everything in the hope, you know, that one in, one, one in 10 proposals will come off and that will justify the, uh, the, the investment, or to be very specific and say, uh, you know, the up, other end of the scale, say, this is the kind of work we're going to go for, uh, and these are the kind of countries in which we, went, we wish to operate, or regions or sectors in which we wish to operate, and then take the risk of, uh, of falling victim to the whims of donors and finding disenfranchise, yourself disenfranchised when the donor um, agenda has moved on. So it, it is extremely difficult to get that balance right. And I think first and foremost, I'd like to hear the experience and insights of the other, other panelists on whether they feel it is possible to have uh, a long-term business development strategy in this market? Uh, or is it simply a luxury that few can afford? Who would like to be the first to comment on that issue? Without a volunteer, I'm just going to name nominate someone. I'm happy to. <laughs> Nicholas, it's all. Just had to find the mute button again. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I mean in, in broad strokes, I think you obviously want to have a defined long-term strategy as best as you can, but you have to accept the fact that it's going to change and you're going to have to be nimble and you're going to have to um, jump on opportunities as they arise and wind down projects or efforts that may not pan out. I mean, so I think flexibility is part of any long-term term strategy. Um, and you, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the smaller players being at a, a disadvantage as opposed to the larger who, who have the track record. And I think that's a, a, fair, a fair assessment, but I think there are some things that um, smaller players can, can do to give themselves some of that competitive or to gain some of that competitive advantage back. Um, one of the things um, that we did at Project Syndicate, and I consider us in a in the small category, um, really. Um, but one of the things we did that was quite effective um, was to, a couple of years back, really think long and hard and strategically about building out an advisory board. Um, not a board of trustees, not a board of overseers, not part of our legal structure, but a board dedicated to um, 
networking and opening doors and making connections and leveling that playing field a little bit by being able to give a friendly introduction to person at Foundation X or person at uh, Corporation Y. And I think that's a little trick that everybody can, um, if they're not already doing it, certainly can do. Think about a business advisory board or a, or a fundraising board. Good. No, I think that's uh, relevant and important and certainly uh, a tactic that has benefited the smaller players in the past. Melissa, the floor um, is yours. Yeah, sure. Just to add on what Nicholas was saying, I think that there's two different things here that are very important to take into consideration. First is when you think about long-term strategy, you know, first you have to think about the organization and you have to really spend a lot of time and invest time in thinking about what you want to accomplish long-term and how you're going to how you're going to build out your mission and vision, right? And you do have to be flexible, like Nicholas said. Um, one of the most important things to take into consideration, too, when you're trying to access big dollars from large donor grants is that obviously one of the biggest challenges organizationally for small organizations is that, you know, there are issues of compliance, right? There are a lot of times where, you know, smaller organizations won't necessarily be able to comply or, or satisfy the requirements of a very large international development donor just by, by, because they're small and they don't have the track record. And I think one of the things that need that a very good strategy is always to be able to develop your relationships with larger organizations, partner organizations, uh, um, and be able to partner with them. It's always, you know, uh, a very good way to start getting into the development sector, partnering with a larger institution that has the track record, that understands how to work with uh, a donor, but obviously it has to be aligned with the mission and vision. I mean, if, you know, uh, or an organization doesn't really stick to what they hold true, really analyze it, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to continue to grow in a way that's logical, right? So that would be my two, my, my, my two key points there is that it's organizational and that you keep to the mission and develop a strategy with a board of directors, a board of advisors, like Nicholas said. I mean, it is very, very important to be able to take advantage of um, stakeholders and partners that are supportive of your organization and are champions to really be able to help you extend your network, but also think uh, big picture. And also, um, it's also important for organizations to develop relationships with partner NGOs or partner institutions that they know that can be able to work with them in other, to expand programs. Absolutely, I think that many uh, organizations getting into the market will, will, will see this as a kind of chicken and egg situation that you can't apply for, for funding unless you have track record, you can't get track record without funding. Right. Uh, so it, it becomes a difficult conundrum. And I think, yes, uh, partnerships, uh, uh, riding on the back of other projects, uh, delivering a small component of a larger project in order to develop track record. These are very important and very effective strategies. Josh, did you have anything you wanted to add? I would just um, come from the complete other angle and that's about um, building those long-term strategic partnerships with particular donors. Like we have with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. Uh, we've been working with them now since the late 90s, I would say has our ups and downs, but we do, we, uh, our development mission is, is pretty much aligned with what their development aid packages are about every time they do a new round. And we do all the extra stuff that um, really makes, makes our voices heard that actually is affecting maybe their strategy itself. For example, we're constantly liaising with all the embassies around the world. We're constantly providing them inputs. We go to all the different types of uh, smaller meetings in the Hague. So we make ourselves available to our donors as well, because it's also a way we can advocate literally for what uh, they want to spend their money on. So yes, it's kind of uh, meaning we're a bit of a middle, middle level player and having the resources to do something like that. So I'm not sure it's uh, relevant for everybody, but even on the, on the local level, we have some incredible local partners, even here in Bolivia, they know every ambassador in La Paz. They have incredible relationships they built with them and they built that based on our kind of the credibility we gave them as becoming our local partner. So I think just to kind of uh, reemphasize what Melissa said, if you can get a credible partner that is linked to donors, you can do a lot with that reputation locally. And that's what I've seen our partners here in Bolivia do in Kenya and numerous other countries. So that's, I think, uh, one extra thing that they can work on as well. 
Okay. I mean, a lot of what we're talking, we've been talking about uh, is effectively chasing grants, is looking for opportunities or developing opportunities, and then dedicating the resources necessary to apply. Uh, where, what's your experience of uh, institutional funding? Uh, do you think the opportunities are there? Do you think that the amount that can be, that can be raised in terms of uh, institutional funding justifies the resource and commitment that's required to achieve it? Michael, by institutional, you mean uh, international donors, large foundations? I mean, what? No, I, I, I mean core funding. I mean, effectively, uh, okay. the ability, having a, a, a regular income that's guaranteed by a donor or multiple donors year in, year out, that's not linked to projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were just talking about this at BJC the other day. Um, yeah, we need like a, um, we, do, we do need like a benefactor like that. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, but if you can get something like that or be linked up to a trust or something like that where you have a guaranteed minimum level that covers like the basic costs, so you're not running around living off project um, income, um, that is the most desirable place you can be in. In the Netherlands, for example, we have some, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry, the clean. Um, one um, one thing that we uh, one 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 mechanism that works very well in the Netherlands, just to give an example, is the postcode lottery, and they give out core grants to I don't know how many nonprofit organizations every year, but it's in the tens, and those grants um, uh, provide ten to fifteen to twenty percent of the regular income that is not project related at all. So these places do exist. It's just finding them, make, building relationships with them, and making sure that they continue year after year. I don't know if you've heard of any. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think it's more in terms of having diversified funding base of what you were talking about, Michael, is to make sure that you know you are always have your core operational expenses basically covered. And and it really does depend upon the organization. That's also why it's so important to have a board of directors or advisory board to be able to help provide some really good feedback and good ideas that are creative. Depending on what the organization is, it really does, you know, differ. But you know, a lot of what um, for example, for our local partners in Bolivia, right? One of the things that I provide to them is um, help on doing business development strategy, right? Helping them do a business plan, long-term strategic planning, um, and helping them look at how important it is to diversify funding bases, right? And what different types of funding is available. One of the things is fee-for-service for certain things, you know, whether they can off offer consultancies, whether they can offer, you know, um, uh, renting out space, for other NGOs in their in their environment or in their area to be able to have press conferences and all that, you know. So uh, also offering fee for service in terms of um, um, uh, workshops or seminars, events, and stuff. events yeah. um, really does help. So one of the things that uh, that smaller NGOs really need to do is really get creative, right? And think about certain different types of funding opportunities that can exist that aren't necessarily project based that might you know that might entail offering their services in a different way to the community but but also keeping in mind like what nico said having <clears throat> making sure your status is correct this profit right. nonprofit, it differs per country mm -hmm. and it changes depending on what awful government you might have at the moment so if i can say this quietly they instituted in bolivia an ngo law which forced everybody to re-register and they lost all of their different types of uh, fundraising stra uh, strategies. So even with the best ones, you have to constantly, continually update the context that you're working in because NGOs are under threat right now in lots of countries. So this also is complicating an already tough, complicated environment for us to have strategy in. Yeah, yeah. and just to, just to underscore uh, diversity of revenue streams is, is, is super duper important. Um, core funding, in, in my experience and in the Project Syndicate experience, has always been sort of the, the holy grail that we could never really find. All of our um, donor money is coming from private foundations mainly and very much project-based. And uh, the challenge for us is to, um, you know, find the projects that align with what we're doing and have enough of these different projects in various stages that that pipeline is always replenished or full or stable. But we could never do that uh, without our other core revenue um, inputs that we put just as much time and energy into. Um, so yes, you have to have multiple revenue streams. 
Uh, it's also linked, I think, to the ability or the flexibility to be able to expand and contract. I mean, I think that you know, in the UK, for example, there has been the experience of several organisations, uh, one of which I used to work for, uh, of being given core funding, uh, expanding uh, in line with the, the, the new resources and new opportunities that that offered. Uh, then the core funding comes to an end and you're, 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 you're thrown to your own devices and to try and fill the void left by core, core funding with project funding is, is next to impossible. Uh, and of course, the trick is not to put yourself in a position where you're committed to uh, large teams on long term contracts, you know, who have to be built into, into projects in the longer term uh, when core funding runs out. Have any of you had similar experiences? Do you find that also works on a, on a, on a kind of smaller level with local organizations in the countries in which you operate? You know, within the media and outside the media, I mean, NGOs, because I work in media, but I also I work in public health, in global public health. So I work with two different sort of kind of populations, but suffer, they suffer from the same sort of problems and challenges. Um, what you find for the traditional NGO, regardless of whether it's media or another, another area is the same thing. A lot of people will end up getting their project-based funding and not have enough um, time to really develop diversified funding base, right? So they don't have necessarily the business planning skills or the development skills to really think long-term, right? So um, when people get into the NGO world, they're all very well, um, well-intentioned. These are all do-gooders who want to do something, who aren't necessarily people who come uh, from the business sector for the most part, who, who really do have that kind of uh, very analytical thinking skill set that you need sometimes when you run a business. Because in the end, an NGO is a business too. It's just our profit is different. Our profit is social. Um, so it is the same malaise for everybody. But one of the things that I tell people when I try to give them consultancy or advisory thing is that you need to have a good core staff that isn't that's not just project, but you also need a development person, right? You need to hire somebody to really to be able to help you develop that strategy. And you have to take time. A lot of times, most NGOs, media or otherwise, are all overstretched, overworked. They're, one, they're trying to do many, many things. They want to be able to do all their projects, satisfy their donors, and they don't necessarily have the time to actually sit be, and analyze with folks outside of the NGO who will give them that perspective. You know, so that you need to have programmatic people, you need to have a development person, and you need to actually have time within the institution to actually sit and think and analyze. Yeah. What we try to do, I mean, we're lucky in a way because our grants are for five years, but we're, what we work with our local partners on starting literally in year three, so they don't hit a ledge in year five if we don't get refunding or they don't get funded again, is we already start getting to think like this. We literally, not force them, but we make them, <laughs> to get a development officer, even if it's part-time. And at the same time, we're also making sure that all our projects are as absolutely visible, where, where, where it's safe, as visible as possible, to get all that extra uh, local visibility and credibility. You don't know who's gonna come running to you. Our local partners now have um, local sponsorships from all kinds of companies and businesses that are actually putting their resources into particular projects because they really like them, because we made sure from the very beginning to make them as absolutely visible and um, as interesting as possible to all kinds of uh, potential donors and partners. And uh, I have to say a few of our partners have been really, really successful at this. And I'm not worried about their survival, their sustainability when their grant ends after next year if we don't win another five year round. Do you have a specific example of a, a, of a project that has been successful in, if you like, operating as a, a business unit, you know, within a wider organization? You mentioned sponsorship from, uh, from, from companies and corporations. Do you, do you have an example of how that's worked? Because I, I think it's, you know, obviously the other model for business development is looking at it in terms of, of long-term projects, is using a project to be a flypaper for funding over a long period of time then you need to build those resources that you're talking about within the project, not just within the organization. And I'm interested to know if you have examples where a project has been able almost to operate as a kind of, uh, as a going concern. I can butt in again. If I can put my voice in here again. Um, I, I'll actually t uh, talk about the project we're, we're in Bolivia for at the moment. It's called Primera Plana, front page. It's a, a 
It's a broadcasted reality journalism show, uh, investigative journalism competition that's on the ATB national network here. And in the first year we, we did it, you know, we had pretty deep, okay ratings, but suddenly people started to realize that it's, it's, a, it's, an investi it's a competition among all the journalism universities, uh, universities with journalism programs in the country. And suddenly everybody saw this, uh, a lot of sponsors saw this incredible market of journalists, youth, and we started to capitalize on the fact that yes, you know, we started to get audience numbers to show potential sponsors and advertisers how our program was working. It's all nonprofit, we're not uh, doing anything from this, but now the sponsors are actually uh, funding core components of the program itself, like, um, uh, like uh, stuff that's linked to youth, you know, some mobile phone companies, um, okay. There was some sort of uh, health groups that were interested in, in uh, youth uh, health issues at the universities, and they're all, uh, you know, and these are private companies that are actually uh, inputting money uh, into the into the program itself. And we're able to do that with our partner here because they have this status, maybe like what Nico was talking about. They have a status where they can actually bring in funding, and they can also get a, uh, you know, actual uh, cash payments. <laughs> But then they also have a whole nonprofit side where they can fundraise at the same time. So the two have kind of gone together. So even if we don't win another grant here, I know this TV, this program is going to go on, which is having really major impacts on uh, journalism schools, their curriculum, on audience uh, measurements of news and media literacy, uh, as we're learning more about our audience. And uh, I think it's going to continue with or without uh, this other kind of funding. So we kind of gave it the, the seed funding, and now it's launched itself. I call it uh, yeah, no. nonprofit venture. Capitalism. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because that's kind of the other the other holy grail of media development is the S word sustainability. You know, is demanded by all donors with, in my opinion, very little idea of how it can be achieved. Uh, and I would say, I mean, you may disagree, but I would say it's the exception rather than the rule. The projects uh, morph into any kind of long term sustainable operation. Um, you know, for me, this is about expectation management. This is about uh, not uh, over-promising and under-delivering. It's being completely realistic about what can survive and what can't, or maybe what aspects of a project, you know, have a sustainable future and which aspects don't. Um, Nicholas, I wonder if you had any insights into, into that issue around kind of, you know, sustainability developing kind of business uh, generating operations within the context of a project uh, and any perhaps examples you have of how that has worked in the past. Sure, yeah, so to um, give a very concrete example um, of, of this, I think something that we're working on right now. So we have um, for many years going back to actually you know, almost 10 years now, 2009, uh, one of the long running projects that we've been working on is in the realm of um, you know, climate change and sustainability and green growth supported by a, um, a European donor focused on, on, on climate. And uh, our role as Project Syndicate with the distribution that we have to you know, the 500 some uh, media outlets that we distribute content to was to really generate content and put a focus on, on these issues. Um, they cared about. Um, and that's some of the project stuff we do um, quite often. Um, in this particular case, this um, donor is quite close and we've built up a track record. Um, and just earlier this year, we pitched them the idea of, hey, we're going to continue this project. Can you kick in just a little bit of seed funding? We're talking about a few tens of thousands of dollars so that we can publish a magazine. And we're going to go out and uh, find some sponsors for the magazine. We're going to set up some distribution partnerships and we're going to use this uh, vehicle, this print vehicle to get this content that we're all working on together into the hands of influential people, you know, the people that they want to influence in, in their policy fields and in the, in the fields they work with in climate change. And that's opened up the door for us to take a very commercial approach to a project. Um, where we're going after um, corporations, um, you know, financial services corporations, um, other climate activist organizations, and um, selling advertising and sponsorship space. Um, and that's working very well for us. Um, and it's um, maybe something that could be replicated in other um, similar situations. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do something a little bit unfair and target someone from the uh, from the audience. <laughs> As I can see, I can see Mike De Villiers' name there. Mike, if you don't know, is the uh, director of RX Europe. Are you actually able to 
uh, can you signal if you can if you're going to be able to speak back? <laughs> because uh, I wanted to get Mike just to say a few words about his experiences in Belarus of developing um, the European radio uh, that has been operating there. And I know, I mean, I'm a big admirer of RX Europe because I think one uh, uh, of their the key planks to their business development strategy has been around uh, supporting individual projects in the long term uh, and focusing on countries, you know, where they can make a difference uh, and they can be a key, key player over a long, longer period of time. So it would be interesting just to get an update from him on where things stand with the Better Russian project and perhaps some of the challenges and frustrations that he has faced in terms of fundraising for that operation. I think if I click allow to talk, you can talk, right? No, you can't talk. <laughs> Unmute. This experiment has failed. Maybe not. Hi, Michael. Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. I just actually stepped out, so I missed some of your question there. <laughs> right. Boring, and ask you to repeat it. Yeah, you missed all the really nice things I said about RX Europe, so I'm not going to repeat those. It'll no, go to your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I was, we were, we had been talking about uh, the challenges of kind of supporting individual projects in the longer term and applying for follow-up funding um, and uh, giving them a sustainable future. And I was referring to your experience in Belarus around uh, European radio. Um, and yeah. wondered if you could say a few words. I don't know where they are now, to be honest with you, but I know that, you know, that, uh, that back in the day when you uh, were, were first involved, that was, a, that, that was a major challenge, but one to which you committed quite significant resources. So perhaps you could give us a little bit of an insight into that experience. Sure, I can explain simply. It was one of those perfect examples where we actually had funding to, to find the additional funding. Um, which you referenced earlier, if you have institutional support, then you can go out and find other funding for projects and you have a much better chance of securing continuity. If you only have the project and the project funds to support your organization, then you're basically scrambling and you, you don't have the time to invest in fundraising. So we had funding from USAID initially, which included funding for fundraising to get funding from other donors. So it was extremely helpful. Um, and uh, um, we were able to work with uh, Euro Radio to help them put in place the internal structures that the other donors were looking for. So on that level, it was a kind of a, a rather unusually perfect uh, match. And it ended with Euro Radio securing its own funding um, from USAID with a direct grant, for example, plus having a whole host of other donors. So it's, it's an unusual example. So I'm afraid the, the, sort of, the cynical comment is that it's, it's still a lot of work and it's very tough, but it's doable if you have the resources to actually get um, additional funding. So in that case, it came from the project. The project included looking for further funding. Um, but then um, it's also doable if you as an organization have core funding and can look for further funding for your organization. Other than that, our experience is that it's extremely tough because as one of the panel mentioned earlier, you're, you're really, you don't have the time to dedicate to even thinking about uh, long-term fundraising strategies, let alone implementing them. Thanks very much indeed, Mike. I think it's an excellent point. I think. Uh, Perhaps organizations are too uh, coy around um, building in resources in project budgets in order to seek further funding in order to develop business. Because frankly, if donors want sustainability, they need to invest in sustainability yeah. as well. It's not something that happens of its own accord uh, without any input. So I, I think the other area you mentioned of providing the support you know, from the, the mothership towards um, uh, business development activities, training staff within projects to be able to go out there and seek uh, a, a further funding or indeed identify further funding opportunities are also extremely important and I'm sure that's something that, uh, that the panel you know have a long experience of. So, so much I think, and we're, we're going to be talking about donor relationships in a while, but I think so much uh, 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 of the secret in a successful relationship is being uh, 
uh, upfront about what's required in budgetary terms in order to make projects work in the longer term um, and not thinking you know that you have to, 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 to promise of the world in order to get the grant in the first place and then you can sort things out <laughs> after the contract signed so uh, so thanks very much for that for, for, thanks very much for that mike i think that's a, that, that's a useful angle um uh, do we uh, are there examples that you have of uh, of other sort of non typical types of fundraising that have been successful in projects that you've managed um crowdfunding, for example, uh, or uh, uh, using prod materials or products created by projects in order to raise uh, future funding. I wondered if any of you had any new insights into uh, innovative and exciting ways of, of, of raising funds within projects that perhaps you, know, uh, you felt were pushing back the boundaries in that respect. I'll give you an example from the cancer space because I work primarily in public health but in cancer. So, you know, when you look at, at one point, the Live Strong bands, I don't know if you remember those, the yellow arm bands, there's a lot of merchandise related to particularly cancer, particularly to women's cancer, right? One of the things that you see, you know, Pink October, that has now become like a merchandising uh, boom, which is good and bad, right? So a lot of organizations started by one big NGO, which was Susan G. Komen, Foundation in the States really was the basically the pioneer and the American Cancer Society. Those are folks who really understood the value of connecting the ribbons, right? Mm -hmm. And connecting the color of pink with, you know, the certain cause. So now that has become a very big movement. So, you know, within the public health space, you found that also within the HIV A space as well, right? Um, we haven't found anything similar yet I think in the media space as such. I don't know, Josh, if you have any experience in terms of merchandising. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Press Freedom Day is much more prevalent now, but I don't know if merchandising feeds off of that. But I know donors are always uh, more interested these days with what's happening in the, in the press freedom space. Um, the more you mention um, things around press, uh, press freedom activities, um, it always feels a little weird kind of piggybacking or fundraising off these human rights issues, mm -hmm. as Melissa was saying. So that makes this side of our job a little bit, you know, complicated or brings up ethical questions um, on, the, on that side. So I, I think, like I was saying here with uh, the sponsorships we've been able to get for our, our particular projects, we do have another example in Senegal where one of our partners um, who runs a journalism school has been able to actually um, lift off from those students a regional news service, which is now um, selling its ad articles across a lot of Francophone West Africa. So, um, you know, that kind of popped out of another project, uh, which had a full, you know, business plan and uh, a strategy behind it. Nico, you know uh, TDN, I think, pretty well in Dakar. So he's been pretty successful at that. So that would be one other example of actually looking at the resources you have available to you in projects and seeing where something could you know, strategically be, um, you know, brought, used as part of a, of a business plan strategy. But like Melly said, you know, um, we, we, most of the people like us, we don't think this way. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to get, wrap our heads around uh, money. Like, you know, um, these TV reality shows we do now, now we're, um, we're thinking about copywriting them and pat patenting them. Who in the NGO world thinks about copywriting stuff? Mm -hmm. But it's in our own best interest to do it. And then we can sell the licensing fees, which also sounds weird, but you know, it's something we're thinking about now as well. Um, but these are, this is sort of a brave new world. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, and it really does depend on the specific NGO and what their mission is and how they're working. Sometimes, you know, it's an, and it's a very um, sensitive environment for some NGOs, particularly in um, the developing country context. But, you know, I used to be a social marketer and back in the day and in a previous incarnation. And one of the things that I loved in a lot of these social marketing programs is just the power of the t-shirt, you know? So, one of the great things about t-shirts, you know, as an, as an example is, you know, when you have a logo on of a t-shirt and even if you give them away, that's free marketing for you in one way or another, you know, and it's kind of like that brand reinforcement. And um, we already see that in the press freedom realm where there are, you know, um, some t-shirts or books, bags and stuff like that. But there are other kind of innovative ways that can actually help generate income for NGOs that doesn't necessarily sell yourself, sell your soul to like, you know, the corporate capitalist machine. Right. <laughs> you know, as for, you know, speaking for the, you know, from the NGO, but would also help you generate resources, you know, so you do have to think creatively. 
Yeah, and think about um, you know online. We're all on social. We are. We're all posting on social. We're all creating content. I mean, Giving Day um, is a dedicated day for raising funds. You have to be confident in telling your story and the good work you're doing, and just get out in front of people and ask for support. Um, and you'll be surprised. People will support you, and uh, it's a validation of what you're doing, and it helps fill the budget and fill the coffers but you don't know until you get out there and ask. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the second uh, part of, uh, of the webinar, which, is, uh, which will focus on, 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 on relationship building with, uh, with donors. Um, before we do, I just wanted to ask quickly if there was anyone from the, uh, the, the, the group, the participants, who would like to uh, ask a question related to strategy development. Uh, that some of the challenges perhaps you face locally around uh, coming up with a long-term plan for accessing the funding that's both available on the ground and that's available uh, on, on an international level. No pressure. <laughs> if you come back, if you, if you think of anything later on, don't hesitate to ask. You have one? No. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, uh, relationships with donors. Who's your favorite donor? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a crap question, but I actually have a favorite donor. And I'll tell you why I have a favorite donor, because this for me is the, the way they operate, operated, uh, was the ideal approach, in my opinion. Uh, the big lottery fund in the UK, it was uh, an international development fund that uh, obviously took money from the National Lottery. Uh, and it funded a small number of international development projects uh, up to around half a million pounds. Uh, they were extremely um, inventive and courageous. I mean, they would fund stuff that no one else would fund. But what I particularly liked about it was that they had a bidding process that was very much based around a conversation. So you would fill in a, a very simple application form. But the next step was to meet and talk about it. And, you know, most people who applied got that opportunity. And then if they liked your idea and they thought it had potential, they gave you seed funding. And I think this is something that, that should exist everywhere and exists almost nowhere, is that opportunity to, to test out an idea, to test out a set of assumptions, to go out into the field, to do some research, which we so rarely get the opportunity to do. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you'll all agree that too many proposals are written on a copy and paste basis, uh, too many ideas are miraculously transported from one country to another without really uh, an in-depth understanding of whether it will work in the same way as it worked uh, in its previous uh, location. So I, I, I love the idea that they would give you a small amount of, of money to go out and, and, and ask the right questions to the right people uh, and then come back and build those findings into a proposal that really did reflect the needs and priorities of its beneficiary groups. Uh, and of course, you know, everyone tries as much as they can to do that kind of research and to ask those kind of questions, but neither time frames nor resources usually allow us to do it in the way we would like. So uh, I'm very keen uh, to, to lobby with donors, you know, to try and think about doing things that way and to have an incremental approach, you know, that will ensure they get the best possible propo uh, proposals and projects in the longer term. Would any, uh, uh, any of the other panelists like to share positive experiences of donors who they feel, you know, have, have taken a, 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 a less orthodox approach to uh, the bidding process or have a less uh, regimented approach to the bidding process which, process, which I, as I say, I think often gets in the way of, uh, of the best uh, proposals and the best uh, methodologies in the longer term. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll speak a little bit um, of, about um, you know the the work that we've done with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I wouldn't say they're the least regimented or the most unorthodox approach to um, you know concept proposal drafting and the process of iterating and finally getting into to a final project. But I think their approach, although um, very smart and very structured, is is good. 
uh, because it's it's collaborative um, in the sense that there's quite a lot of back and forth with uh, the program officer before the project is even put to its final form and, and, and presented on, on their end for um, final funding. And I think that gives a lot of space to get all of the questions out early and to be open and honest and make sure that everybody's on the same page about exactly what the project is and um, you know what impact are we achieving for and what are the goals and what is this going to cost and how are we as the recipient of the funds going to deliver against this project that we're putting together and what do we need to do that. I think that's all good. And I think that's, uh, it just has, it has to be that way. It needs to be front, the com conversation needs to be front loaded uh, and open. And our experience has been that with them. Okay, interesting. Melissa? My best experiences actually have been with smaller foundations, right? Mm -hmm. That actually have the time and who are very, very focused on a specific issue, right? So if you know that you really are a very good fit, one of the things that I like about working with smaller foundations, even though you don't necessarily get the same level of funding, it is much more of a relationship because like Nico said, it's important to be able to front load that conversation. And you want to ideally have a relationship or is it just where you're looking at the donor as the bank and you're just delivering on, you know, making sure that they're happy with, you know, whatever they're expecting of you. But more, you do want to have a conversation with them because one of the things that we all know working in the development sector is that what we put on paper, right, the proposal that we develop and we can develop fabulous theories of change and fabulous log frames, you know, we have risks and assumptions and all that stuff, but when it comes down to actually implementing, we have to have a certain amount of flexibility and things aren't necessarily gonna go always to plan. So you really do wanna have a donor that understands that, that supports you, that you feel comfortable enough to say, listen, this is what we propose. And I think that we'll be able to do this in X amount of time, but looking at it now, looking at all these different variables, we might need a little bit more time and we, we might need to refine uh, what our project goals and objectives are. So you really do want to have that relationship with the donor that can say, listen, this is, and also take advantage of their expertise, right? One of the great things about Gates Foundation is that, you know, they do have a whole cadre of the best and the brightest there. Yeah. And the goal is that, yeah, it is very, very difficult to get funding from Gates, but when you get it, you get the support of people that actually really do want to know, you know, know what they're doing in their field, right? So, but for the most part, I've had really good relationships with small donors. You know, I've had very good relationships with larger donors, mostly because of the relationship that I've built with the technical officers that have been in charge of those proposals, right? If you have a really good yeah. gel professionally, personally with that person, it really does help to help navigate all of the bureaucratic uh, loopholes, you know, not, not loopholes, but all the bureaucratic restrictions, especially for, you know, a lot of the larger development donors, you know, just, you know, there's, it just, that's the, the that's the nature of the beast. But you really do want to have, you want to cultivate that good relationship. Which donors do you know as a matter of interest that give you feedback on failed proposals? Because I think, again, this is an area that uh, isn't give, given anywhere near enough uh, uh, emphasis uh, and resource from the donor's side. They leave you in a limbo. You know, you get maybe best case scenario, uh, a, a tick box evaluation grid, which uh, will give you a score that means nothing at the end of it. Uh, I think it's, again, the exception rather than the rule that donors give feedback. And I appreciate that to do it requires an enormous amount of work uh, and nobody um, sitting in the ivory tower of a donor organization particularly wants to engage with frustrated um, proposal writers who believe they should have won <laughs> and are deeply aggrieved they didn't. But on the other hand, I think in terms of building relationships with the implementing agencies in the longer term, it's, it's, it's essential to have uh, that feedback and essential to kind of build uh, a, a relationship that's uh, based on, um, on, on a two-way dialogue uh, that will eventually um, help agencies, proposal writers to produce better bids in the longer term. Anyone got an experience of donors who give feedback? Yeah. You. Sort, you sort of. Know? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> um, I'll go back to my, uh, my main uh, grant mechanism from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We actually have pretty good interactions and feedback mechanisms built in with their, their embassies. 
So we actually, um, uh, they're invited to a lot of our events. They have annual or biannual meetings with local partners to hear and get feedback on how things are going, but they also, they also give back their feedback. So a lot of this is done on site, face to face. And um, I found that, you know, um, it, it, it depends on each embassy, of course. Some are more integrated and, and more interested in this. But in general, all the embassies that we work with have an overwhelming interest to make, to see the, the project become successful. And so they do, I wouldn't say they interfere, but they do, you know, they do this as a, um, as a diplomatic way of bringing in all the, uh, the local NGO partners with them to get their feedback, but also to offer their own uh, int interest in, uh, in uh, what's, what, what their priorities are, or if the priorities are changing. The good thing about our grant, which is five years, there's no five-year program. We look at it every year. We update it every five or six months, depending on how the local circumstances change. So that's why uh, this feedback we get from the embassy can actually have an immediate impact if we feel it makes sense within our project. We don't have to take all their feedback into account, but we listen to them. And we've been able, that's why our projects have been able to really uh, react quite quickly and nimbly to um, changing situations in the country. And I think, um, some of the fact that the uh, the embassy people are involved is, is actually helps us, helps us to make that happen. Oh, yeah. And in my experience too, that the people that tend to give feedback really are from from the projects that I've worked on. It actually been when NGOs have submitted proposals for very very large tenders, right? For development agencies, if you're going to, mm -hmm. you know, they will provide feedback because they realize too how much time and effort you know different consortium groups have spent to try to develop the proposals. So they will provide that, you know. Um, smaller, smaller foundations don't tend to give as much to that, especially if they're open calls. You know, if you've been requested to, to submit a proposal, it's a different thing, right? But open calls is everybody, you know, so it's very, very hard for them. But one of the things that we should talk about, you know, with the donor community is how to actually provide more feedback because that's the only way that uh, NGOs learn how to do a better job, you know, and learn, to understand what it is that they're looking for. You know, one of the big challenges, especially within the media world, is how to, you know, um, write proposals using that language, using development language, which isn't necessarily a media development. You know, mm -hmm. people who work in media assume just because they're writers, right, that they can write that certain proposal in a certain way that they will understand, and they don't, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a different, those are different technical skills, mm -hmm. right? So we should be able to, at, at some point, kind of collectively lobby the larger group of donors to be able to provide us more, but they don't, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, only for the big ones. And what do you think? Money. What do you think will be effective platforms for doing that? Um, I mean, I think everyone agrees that uh, there is a lack of coordination between donors in many countries and particularly on a regional level. Uh, and many implementing agencies feel they don't get the opportunity to engage and to share success and failure. Uh, and as a result, you know, donors continue to be perceived uh, as being disconnected from the realities on the ground. Um, do you know of or can you conceive of any effective platforms for that kind of ongoing interaction between donors and implementing agencies. I mean, not necessarily in media development, but uh, I think uh, it's, it, it is a, a, um, a dilemma that has yet to be resolved. But I think that there's a, there are certain organizations that are not international, that are service umbrella organizations that can provide that, kind of become the arbiter or the conduit between uh, funders and the larger, you know, and the larger collective group of the NGOs. I'll give an example. So for, uh, I work with the Union for International Cancer Control. That's the largest federation of cancer organizations in the world. Mm -hmm. And they are basically a lobbying organization to make sure that the profile of cancer is raised internationally, right? But one of the most important things that they do is not only do they work with the UN, but they also work with the donor community to be able to um, interface with them more. It's not necessarily pitching the donor for specific project-based funding, but to be able to kind of raise the flag on what issues are really important and what they really need to pay attention to long-term, right? So I think that umbrella organizations do fit a role, have a role here, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, specific one I would, comes to mind immediately is the uh, Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, which is an outspring of uh, National Endowment for Democracy. I think those guys under new leadership are really trying to play this role, 
bringing the donors together to get donor um, donor coordination, but mainly advocating for media development budgets to go up. I think to get them to 0.5%, 0.5 of 1% of all development aid in the world. So there is something brewing within our community and hopefully that, that, that'll that work as good as it's been doing in cancers to constantly keep media development, press freedom and donors faces constantly nonstop. Yeah, another one to look at is the media impact funders. The, the media impact funders? Media impact funders. funders. Uh, and and tell us for So you cut out there, I couldn't hear. Oh, sorry, no, just Media Impact Funders. It's, a, it's an umbrella organization um, that works on the behalf of funders. I'm reading off their website, committed to effective okay. use and support of media and the public interest. Uh, and they have, uh, I'm not super familiar with them, um, but they do have, uh, they do a lot of media funding mapping um, and relationship mapping and network mapping and, and things like that. So I would suggest people look at it and check it out and see if there's something there. And, and, and of course, GFMD. <laughs> Sorry. We're all here. I've been sitting here waiting for someone to mention them. What's going on? Um, Can I say one okay. more thing? Um, Can I mention yeah, one more thing? It's also this, uh, I think Nico knows about them. It's, this, uh, it's from another site, from the donor site, coming together as a group called Civitatas, which is in yeah. Brussels. And it brings together mm -hmm. a lot of... Uh, private foundations that want to do more in media development and they're trying to coordinate their actions through one, one um, grant making unit. So we've had some small interactions with them at this point. It's called Civitatus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Good. I mean, I, I, I'm interested to know to what extent you think uh, donors are kind of evolving. <laughs> are they moving on? Are they taking on board the kind of frustrations that we encounter? And are they applying those to uh, the findings to their kind of long-term uh, strategies and to the, the focus and scope of their programs? Uh, coincidentally, I've just been commissioned uh, by the European Union or DG NEAR as it's called, the directorate that deals with the countries immediately surrounding the European Union to carry out a, a, a needs assessment of uh, independent media in the Middle East and the uh, former Soviet Union countries and the idea is that we'll spend the next eight months talking to independent media across both those regions. Uh, we'll come back with a set of recommendations which the Commission will use allegedly to shape its uh, funding programs for media for the next four or five years. So it's, a, it's an interesting initiative, uh, one that carries a significant burden of responsibility but uh, I, I, I think it's very encouraging. I think it's encouraging that uh, a big regional donor like the European Commission has decided at last that it's a good idea to go out there and ask people what they want, uh, what they're missing particularly, and how donors can, can, can provide targeted uh, and effective support on the ground. Uh, it's also uh, a, an attempt to try and move away from the usual suspects. So to uh, consider beneficiaries, you know, in the round, the wider landscape of beneficiaries, rather than uh, showing, uh, maybe this is an unfair comment, but showing uh, a certain preference towards organizations that do uh, have uh, strong business development capabilities, that have employees who speak perfect uh, American accented English and uh, you know that the, it, it, there's a lot of there's, there's a certainly a lack of um, uh, of um, equity as far as uh, the the engagement between donors and sort of beneficiaries on the ground is concerned so this is a, a an attempt to address that and to come back with some solid ideas about how the EU can uh, better target its uh, its funding for media um, uh, from 2020 onwards. Uh, and there's been a couple of other uh, uh, initiatives similar to that. So I think that is a sign, I hope, maybe I'm just being very optimistic, that is a sign, you know, of some evolution of an understanding that in fact they don't have all the answers. Uh, that, 
I, I don't mean to interrupt my but I actually have to go Please. teach a class in about 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to log off. Josh will stay. I'll be here. I hope uh -huh. this was an interesting conversation for everybody. If you need any more encouragement, questions, you can find me. And good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. It was good, and, and for your and for your contribution, it's very useful indeed. Um, yeah, no. So, uh, uh, the, by the way, is everyone expecting this to finish now, <laughs> or is it going on for an, for for another twenty five minutes? Because I I'd understood it was an hour and a half. No. Anne Marie. Gone. <laughs> um, okay. Well, anyway, I'll plow on, and uh, uh, you let me know if you have the if you if you if you have the. Um, I the just time to you on continue. the chat, Michael. But yes, uh, I've scheduled for an hour and a half. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Good. Um, so, well, I was talking about about the evolution of donor thinking and whether uh, you felt that there had been uh, positive developments in the way that uh, programs were being designed. Uh, again, I think, you know, I'm sure you'll agree the old model whereby you would commission a couple of consultants to go out and draw up a terms of reference, uh, you know, for what might be a, a long term and ambitious project. Uh, they never result, they never led to the best results. Uh, and to have more empirical evidence and data of what the end beneficiaries need has always got to sit at the heart of, uh, of long-term donor strategies. Do you, in your experience, feel that that is happening, and more of that is happening, or is it uh, something that's still the exception rather than the rule? Josh. <laughs> I still think it's a little bit more of the exception. Um, you know, uh, the EU tends to be, we, we've applied for lots of grants from them, which are always top down. They tell you exactly what they want. You know, you try to find all the best phrasings to fit their terms of reference. Um, I think the best kinds of grant proposals, uh, you know, open calls and things are those where you can go to them, where they give you a broad set of, let's say, criteria or long-term strategic missions. And then, you, and then you put your strategy together that can most effectively and efficiently meet that, you know? I think there needs to be more of that. That's why I like the funding we get from the Dutch government. They, they just set broad parameters and we go and we, we come up with our own strategies. And like I said, those strategies are constantly in flux and change. And that's another issue with some of the bigger donors like the EU where, um, you know, the, the process is so long. Or the UN, we're still waiting for an answer from a grant we sent in a year and a half ago, uh, which is still fresh, I guess. I mean, the context has completely changed. So they also need to get their timelines figured out um, and to get back to you quickly, especially now in what's going on in press freedom and media development, you know, the, 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 the context are changing every week. So uh, I think they have to keep that in mind as well. But I'm glad to hear that they're doing their research and coming up with their terms of reference in a more, let's say, progressive way. That, that's, that's good news. I agree. I've actually got, well, uh, uh, I have a hand that's come, that's, um, <laughs> appeared from the attendee group. So we're going to give uh, the floor to Yara Bada, uh, if I can do it. Yara, can you hear me? I think you need to Thank you. take the mute off. Yeah. Is, do, do you hear me now? I we do. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, and, and sorry if I'm going to uh, take a step back or, or forward. Please correct me and stop me whenever you want because I'm from Syria. So you can imagine how crazy situation is and then we have so many questions. I work with the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression since 10 years now. And also I have a colleague attending here is Mohammed. Um, and I would start where uh, Josh was talking. Thank you so much, Josh, uh, for putting um, the, the issue of, of timeline of donors uh, on the table because yes, this is one of the problems we faced in Syria. Everything was crazily moving and changing. And the time you make your assessment of the needs and, 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 and you build your project and then time for donors to review and get back to you, things change, uh, which affected us so much. Uh, second thing, we, we um, as a Syrian organization, we build our strategy about where we think 
uh, media development in Syria should take a direction. And then most donors said, like, for example, in the Syrian Center, we said we need to, to focus, uh, part of our focus at least should continue in on, on uh, academic um, level. So we have our own magazine, but most of the donors said, no, we should focus on uh, supporting journalists, which we do. But um, it was it was uh, confusing uh, to to most donors focusing on one point. Um, was like we didn't have much margin for for uh, areas of focus, different areas of focusing. Last issue, like third main difficulty we face, I would say not an issue. Uh, maybe it is an issue in Syrian context. I don't know. Like in 2013, there was a crazy fund for Syria media, Syrian media, but. When we now review it, we found it was mostly for initiatives. And until today, uh, most donors I know, and I would say I know a, a bit during 10 years, like um, most of them prefer to support projects. No one wants to support a more sustainable, long uh, term of capacity building and it's institutional work, you know what I mean? If you go to, to put in your pro proposal like a core fund or reserve or I don't know what, uh, most, most will, will argue you with you a lot. Um, and, and fourth, last problem we face, if you have any advices for us on all those points, I would be very grateful, is like many donors said, well, you know, Syria take a lot of fund, we should focus on another area. Yes, that's the truth. Syria take a lot of support, but for humanitarian needs related to the type of the conflict we have, it's not for media development, you know, and, 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 and that's difficult to argue um, generally, I would say, because yes, the humanitarian needs are very, very, very huge. Uh, but this focusing on this or, or, or applying to this should not like stop us as a donors from putting also interest and, and, and uh, money maybe, I don't know, in, in media development, which we are tomorrow going to, when conflict to have a, some kind of end, we are going to look and find, okay, what's about my media development? You know what I mean? Um, thank you. And sorry if I took so much from your time. Thank you very much, Nidhiara, for that. Uh, the, I mean, I think you've summed up very well <laughs> a lot of the frustrations that uh, are faced, uh, not just by agencies operating in Syria, but even worldwide. Um, there is a, a, a lack of patience amongst many donors in terms of um, wanting quick wins and instant results and not getting them, very often not getting them from media development projects because of the nature of the work we do. I mean, so many uh, initiatives have a very slow burn and the uh, the real results are only seen uh, in the fullness of time uh, and indeed even when they are seen they tend to be results that are more abstract and concrete so donors who try to draw links between uh, media development projects and building bridges will very often come out of this process feeling uh, disillusioned uh, and uh, I think that in some ways the implementing uh, agencies themselves have been guilty of um, giving false expectations to donors uh, in order to win funding uh, when you know, perhaps we should be better at uh, fighting our corner and standing our ground and being more adamant about the fact that we aren't going to be able to deliver instant results, that it is going to take more time, that they do need to invest uh, in, in a more um, sustained way. So uh, I, I, to a certain extent, I think it's, uh, it, it's a two-way street, but I agree that uh, in uh, environments like Syria, there simply needs to be uh, a different set of expectations and strategies that need to be agreed with all the players as early on as possible um, so that you know, the, it can be a, a partnership. Uh, and not uh, a sense of kind of push and pull between donors and implementing agencies, which ends up leaving both sides frustrated. Josh, anything to add to that? I'm sure you've had uh, similar. Have you worked in Syria, for example? Is that an area that you've covered? No, we haven't. We we uh, we are not. We work in rather harsh landscapes, but not uh, post conflict or conflict areas where I can see where short termism. Uh, from the donor side 
it doesn't make sense, but you, you can see where they just, you know, are not, they want to throw money somewhere and they're not really thinking about the sustainability of local partners in those places. But even, even in, in the places where we work, you know, um, I mean, our whole goal is to put ourselves out of business, right? To solve the problems and move on. And I mean, that's something that we'll always have to deal with. And I, I do think that donors tend to look at us as just tools, middlemen, instruments to get their wider things done. They're not really sure how to work with locals, so they, they work with us. So they really kind of overlook our, our long-term specializations and what we're trying to do. Um, you know, for better or worse, there's even more and more media development issues and problems in the world. So we're gonna have a lot of work to do for a long time, unfortunately. So um, I think a lot of that psychology is part of the, in the mix there as well. I, uh, but I, I don't have any direct experience with Syria, unfortunately, sorry. Nicholas, anything you'd like to add to that, uh, that general debate? No, don't have so much um, direct experience, and I, and I would just um, reiterate one of the points you made, which is, uh, again, when you're having your funding conversations, you have to stand your ground uh, as best you can and, and find a way to push for the funding you need to not only deliver against the project, but to make it a sustainable initiative. Um, and that's easier said than done, um, but it just has to be that way. Um, Yara, I'm interested uh, to know if you were involved in the coordination group for Syria. Do you know about um, that? The, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and um, we are the one who is co coordinating for two years now. Um, I would say my colleague Mohammed is the best to to talk uh, on this because he's the one uh, in charge for all of this cooperation with uh, Syria Coordination Response Group. I don't know, Mohammed. Are you here? He is there. Is it is it Mohammed Haddad? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Let me let me see if I can get him on. Uh, hi. Yeah. Hi, Mohammed. Yeah. Hi. You can speak. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. All. So, in in relation to the point uh, you you asked, uh, <coughs> SCM has worked as a focal point for. Um, uh, international NGOs such as uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, the PU, uh, RSF, uh, to re respond mainly our focus uh, with the, with the uh, partner organizations is to respond to the uh, emergencies that uh, are taking place in, 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 uh, in Syria. So we had several uh, several good or successful collaborations. Um, mostly it used to be um, by uh, mapping the, 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 uh, the, the journalists uh, endangered in, in a certain area or in the area of emergency. And then we develop uh, jointly uh, a response mechanism. Uh, sometimes it uh, consists of uh, an emergency fund to uh, um, mitigate the, the, the effect of, of, of uh, the uh, emergency the journalists are um, dealing with. Uh, sometimes it could uh, um, exceed to relocation if, if that's possible. And, and once we, we had a good collaboration uh, uh, over this, um, so mostly the collaboration was um, regarding emergencies, but if we were to talk about the main topic uh, we are here to discuss, uh, media development um, was very limited uh, over the past years, uh, at least not jointly. It was uh, implemented or conducted uh, each international NGO by itself. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, we have another intervention from Jenna, Jenna Hornsby. I'm going to uh, get her online, I hope. Yes. Yes. Hello. Jenna, please. Hi. Do you hear me okay? I can hear you fine, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I, uh, well, I'm happy to hear uh, from Syrians. Um, I'm not Syrian, as you can guess, but I work for ASML Syria, which is a Syrian-founded, Syrian-led uh, media development organization. Um, I actually was, uh, the, the points that uh, uh, Mohammed and uh, Yara raised, of course, are applying to us as well. Um, we, I mean, 
I think it's accurate to say over the past two or three years, we've experienced just a huge strategic shift on the part of donors um, who are very, I mean, very short term oriented, as was referenced previously, but also have put like enormous political restrictions on where in Syria they can work and, you know, with whom and under what conditions. Um, you know, I've had really hilarious conversations with donors saying that they, they can't work in uh, regime held areas, in Turkish held areas, or in HTS controlled areas. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so this is the, the, the situation we're in. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I guess where we have concluded that what we've concluded we need to do um, in order to sort of make it through this period is, is transition away from these highly, like Ministry of Foreign Affairs kind of highly politically sensitive funding. Um, and we've started to diversify with uh, more sustainable partnerships. Um, we've started trying to do this um, by applying for like um, feminist foundation funding for our uh, program to train female journalists in Syria. You know, trying trying to get away from Syria specific money. Um, and I'm saying that, but we, you know, we haven't really pulled it off yet. It's still theoretical, uh, the plan. Uh, but so I'm curious, you know, if any, like, obviously from Syria, if, if any organizations have succeeded in this type of transition, um, I'm curious to hear from them, but also from other regions um, or, you know, from panelists or participants, if anyone has succeeded in sort of transitioning away from highly politicized money to um, more sustainable partnerships, I'm eager to hear your advice. <laughs> I would say that I have some experience of that. Uh, of, uh, as we've mentioned on several occasions, uh, donors are fickle. Uh, they're driven by political considerations and priorities. They move on and suddenly you find yourself uh, with a fraction of the funding possibilities that existed before. Uh, one form of diversification that uh, is often successful is moving away from a kind of country specific approach or a sector specific approach to something more thematic based. So chasing funding that isn't linked to a country or linked even necessarily to media, but is linked to uh, a set of social issues that the media can address. Uh, and uh, looking for funding that doesn't uh, have uh, perhaps you know, the professional focus uh, that you've been used to, or uh, but, but also doesn't have the political baggage that you've mentioned, uh, is uh, is certainly a way of kind of uh, uh, opening up the possible horizons uh, and entering perhaps uh, a wider donor landscape than the one to which you've become accustomed. Uh, Nicholas, Josh, anything you'd like to add? To, uh, ways in which organizations can adapt to changes in political priorities, to changes in donor priorities, to um, standing on their own feet more effectively uh, when the existing funding begins to dwindle? I would just quickly say um, uh, that, that kind of circles back to uh, the beginning of the conversation um, in terms of diversifying funding sources. And it seems like you're, you're doing absolutely that. And you know what you want to do in terms of the thematic focus and, and the, the project you want to implement and the impact you want to have. So just get after every private foundation or funder, big, small, medium in that space um, and aggressively go after funding and have as many of these project proposals and pitches out there as you can. And some of them will come through and some of them won't. If there are other project areas that you're looking to hone in on or focus on, um, do that as well and, and do it as aggressively uh, as you can. I think you're definitely doing the right thing. I don't know if this is a perfect analogy, but uh, the point you made about donors moving on, I think about you know Central, Central Europe uh, and, and most of the Balkans, which all had incredible media centers through the 90s and into the 2000s. And of course the donors left and half of them immediately collapsed, but some of them survived. Like in Macedonia, the Sarajevo Media Center, uh, sorry, Media Center Sarajevo in Bosnia, Herzegovina, 
Uh, I even think the one in Budapest is still working, the Center for Independent Journalism. So they managed to get past that hump of falling off the ledge when all the main funding dried up. So I think there is a way to do it. They all found their own approach, their own strategies. It might be something to look at. It could be potentially a model. It's clearly not the same situation as Syria, but it is a point where they're suddenly coming to a ledge. Donor funding is stopping, has stopped, but they found thematic ways, new local ways to integrate themselves into other media that was overlooked perhaps before, like Roma, the Roma population, the Roma media, and they were able to find grants around that, looking at the needs assessments in their own countries and in the region, seeing what they were best at. And the best did survive. I mean, uh, some of the ones we thought would always make it, like in Prague or Bratislava and some other places, they all, they all uh, Poland, they all just completely you know, shut their doors. But some carried on and they found new ways of uh, staying viable and, and uh, yeah, viable and, and important. Absolutely, no, I couldn't agree more because I, I worked with <laughs> the Bosnians as well and they were extremely inventive in coming up with new ways of, uh, of, of accessing funding and income. Uh, I think another area actually in which maybe not they but others like them uh, excelled was in, was in, if you like, selling the experience they had had to other organisations that were in a similar position. So effectively advising um, NGOs in, in, in perhaps conflict affected countries, for example, in how to uh, uh, address and overcome the challenges they had faced. Good. Okay. Well, we're nearly done. Um, and uh, thank you very much indeed for the um, for, for the uh, interventions on the floor. I think they were very useful indeed. I um, my, my, my final um, my final question is around uh, just a very quick answers from the panelists around what you feel to be the secret ingredients of, of building long term relationships with donors. Um, to illustrate what I mean, um, for me, it's always been about honesty and openness. It's always been about uh, being very clear from the start uh, about what um, direction the project will is likely to progress in uh, and to be honest about things going wrong. And I think this is a huge mistake that agencies worldwide um, make is to always be upbeat and positive in all of their reports back to donors to give the impression that everything's going incredibly well and to not be open enough uh, about uh, areas of projects that are not going according to plan. And I think we all would agree that the donors, just as much as the implementing agencies, want projects to be successful. So uh, they want to know if there are uh, if there are hidden problems or there are issues that, that, that might derail uh, the project from achieving its goals. Uh, I find honesty and openness with donors is uh, about presenting those problems and finding solutions. And again, I think too many agencies are too married to their original proposals and they believe that the most, the single most important thing is delivering the project to the letter of the initial proposal. And yes, of course, that should be the ambition. But realistically, projects don't go uh, according to the script, particularly when the script has been written maybe a year, a year and a half before the project starts. So it's about giving yourself that space to discuss the problems that do arise and to say, look, this isn't going to happen <laughs> as we said it would. And these are the reasons why. And it's all about the rationale. It's all about saying, this is why uh, it, it, we need to rethink our, our approach. And here are a dozen testimonies from our end beneficiaries <laughs> that uh, support a change in direction. Uh, I think when donors are presented with incontrovertible proof from, uh, uh, from the mouths of the people that they want to support, they very, very rarely insist on uh, an unworkable um, uh, approach. So, uh, or indeed on you know, the, um, the, the kind of contractual minutiae of what was originally um, put on the table. So, so for me, it's those two areas. It's about you know, building that, that, that honest and open relationship from day one. Josh, what would you say are your secrets for that sort of that long-term relationship? Yeah, I think uh, all of that, you know, keeping these channels open back and forth through the whole length of the grant and before it starts as well. But also we built into our current program a midterm review process that the ministry agreed to with us. So that was uh, uh, two and a half years into the program 
where we literally put together a 50 page document going country by country, looking at all of our, our priorities and uh, outcomes and, and what, where, where we fell short and where we think we needed to change it to the point where we're actually t- able to negotiate with them, changing our theory of change, <laughs> the theories of change you know, that we used to actually win the, 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 the grant and actually changing some of our indicators around. And they, they agreed to that, we had their buy-in, but again, we, we, we prefaced this early on in, in, in our relationship with them that we wanted to do this and sit down with them. And we also thought that would influence, uh, play a role in potentially for the next rounds of grants that they have, that they can see that the priorities have already changed. And we were there early on giving them, advocating for these changes. And uh, so it was a really positive experience. Uh, we sat down with the different departments inside of the ministry, the human rights department, the social welfare department uh, that, that, that minister these kinds of development grants. And the, the discussions went really well. And we, 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 uh, we refer to that midterm review document all the time now. It's actually kind of the, uh, you know, the program doc that we look at as we're looking at the, net, the last half of our grant now. So that, that, that process was a really positive experience and really relevant on the ground. Great, thanks very much. No, absolutely, projects involved in being able to document that evolution and uh, use it to recalibrate activities in the latter stages of the project, I think is vital. Nicholas. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys covered a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the secret sauce, but um, just to, to build on a little bit more, I mean, yes, we have um, regular reporting and impact measuring and metrics and KPIs and all of these things that are built into um, grants, big and small. Um, and sometimes we hit them and sometimes we don't. I would just add uh, on top of the honesty and the communication is don't be afraid to reach out to your program officer um, at any time and for any reason. I mean, it is really a, about building a communication and building trust and you shouldn't just be checking in at predetermined uh, dates, uh, monthly or quarterly check-ins or calls. I mean, this is somebody um, you're working with and you're working closely, you both want the project to succeed. So um, put yourself out there and, and be in touch and be, be communicative. And I would also say, um, you know, we talked about building relationships with ongoing donors a lot, but just generally to, to link back to the first part of the conversation about developing, uh, you know, a, a strategy and a business development strategy for uh, fundraising and for building relationships with donors. It's the same stuff. It's about um, being present, being in conversations like this, being involved in organizations, umbrella organizations like this, be in the circles that donors are at, go to the events donors are at, and um, you know, network and make those conversations and build that trust among the, the donor community. I absolutely agree. I, I think that uh, those conversations are also incredibly important in sowing the seeds of new ideas with donors. I think you know you can't uh, overestimate the value of those lift conversations, those elevator conversations, where um, donors are obviously looking to be innovative. They're looking for new ideas. They're looking to make their programs and projects more exciting and more progressive than others. There's competition with, within donor circles, just as there is within uh, um, implement, amongst implementing agencies. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of the good ideas that, uh, that I have uh, later developed into projects have uh, come out of a conversation with a donor whereby, you know, they latch onto an idea, you then give them the ability to go away and run with it and find the, the, the necessary funding to get it off the ground and then you work together on, uh, on it um, in the longer term. So I think it's true that donors are looking for relationships with organizations that they can trust to do a good job, but also to come up with um, creative and innovative input uh, in the longer term. So on that note, uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, for your time and uh, contributions. Thank you very much indeed, Josh. Nicholas, uh, Melissa, you could pass that on uh, for, uh, for, for your excellent insights. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie and Michael for the organization um, and for, for making this happen. Um, and it's been a great pleasure um, from my point of view to, 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 to engage with you, to talk with you um, and to, I hope, um, uh, make some kind of a contribution to a uh, wider understanding um, of uh, the challenges of this sector, and in, but also the opportunities that it offers. Thank you.